Um, so, so just, you know, I know I've filled a couple of people in, but for you guys, the, the teach-ins have been relatively like, low key, just kind of like, they're, they're meant to be a conversation. Um, we've done it a couple times on Ukraine, um, because we're nerds and Ukrainians, and like, we, like when Putin invaded, we were like, we must have discussions about yeah. this. <laughs> and so this was like right after the people, like the pandemic, and we were just coming back, and so we just like, it was basically just us, <laughs> like, and a couple other people, like, mostly yeah. faculty. But, yeah, faculty came, and we yeah, did have a, a few students. Yes, there was a lot of students. Alice, yay, right place. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Um, so, so really, no. what these are, and like, you know, with the, the Ukrainian ones, it ended up being us talking a lot animatedly about Putin and, like, what was happening. Because people had questions. Yay! Um, yeah, people had questions, mm -hmm. and you know, like her expertise was history and all of this stuff, right? So then, last semester, we did one on women in the world because we had the women from Pakistan visiting, and so we thought it would be really interesting to explore women's rights or discrimination and all of this stuff. Really, whatever. Yeah. And it turned about. into a really interesting yeah. conversation, like access to education, pay equality, and you know, this international commonality that we all have. And it was a really nice kind of like round table discussion. And it, it really is just that. It's just a conversation. Like there's no agenda, there's no, you know, there's no list of things we want to get through. It's really just a conversation. And one of the things, yay! One of the things that we want to do is have conversations about things that are, are happening now, right? We want the teachers to be <laughs> welcome to the circle. We want we want these conversations to be about things that are, are current and concerning. And one of the things that I know we're all aware of is the increased encroachment on our rights and on particularly LGBTQ rights in the United States. Um, and so we thought this would be an amazing opportunity to really kind of open the conversation to have about you know what that means, what you know the opportunities we might have are to you know uh, become activists against certain things, but also just what the experiences are. So um, we have Meredith Whitmore here, who is going to be our sort of master of ceremonies. No, I said it wasn't that. What did I say oh, it was? Yay. Uh, facilitator. 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 I was gonna say because you were like, it was like it's not like a you're not lecturing. You're just no. gonna facilitate. Yeah. Um, but really, this is just an opportunity to talk. Yeah. So, so we have no idea where the conversation is going to go. None at all. Right. You go and anywhere. Ask questions, questions or. Um, mm -hmm. And. Yeah. It's only you, pal. No. Well, but also, you know, share experiences if you want, but you don't have to, like, mm -hmm. or whatever. Yeah. So, Safe yeah. space. Absolutely. Yeah, I would say, um, you know, I think it's great that we're having these kinds of conversations. I think I really appreciate, I really appreciate everyone taking the time from their day today to be here. Um, I don't, I didn't prepare any kind of formal thing. I do have some kind of handouts that we could look at if, if we feel like we need some conversation starters or want, you know, some specific topics. Um, these are maps from the human rights campaign that, that track um, different types of legislation and and um, uh, in different states throughout the United States. So you can see uh, marriage equality, because it was federally recognized, uh, is now something that's the law of in all of the 50 states. But when you look at things like, oh, it's a good one. Well, not a good one, but um, <laughs> um, when you talk about which states have um, Banned conversion therapy. We can talk about that, and which haven't. You know, it's which is which picture on that? Different. Which color is which? I guess yes, that's black. a great question. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, just my the thing yellow is to Oklahoma, Texas. Yeah. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> it's a bell weather. <laughs> the yellow states protect you from so-called conversion therapy. So you can see um, a lot on the West Coast, a lot in New England, and then I mean that's what I would have yeah. expected for the yeah. one. No, always worth looking specifically and reading the reading the legends of the <laughs> like a library in the library learning comments, so we're going to be very precise about things. Uh, so your sources like yes, of course she did. <laughs> <laughs> and the mathematicians. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I'm a I'm Meredith, as as we we've said. Um, I use she her pronouns. I'm an advisor or an academic coordinator in the advising and success center over in G building. 
probably not pointing in the right direction. I have a terrible sense of direction. Um, uh, I, I identify as a queer woman, and uh, we can certainly talk about what, how I define those, that word and how other people might define that word, because that certain language is something that's really um, a critical piece of, of uh, a, a, a piece that's important to the issues that we're talking about today and important to the people in this community. Not that I speak for the whole community, you know, LGBTQIA people are not a monolith. It's not one size fits all. Every person's experience is a little bit different. And so what I would say for our conversation today is let's all, I, I'm hopeful that we can all approach it with kind of open ears, open minds, open hearts. Um, hold your opinions lightly. Um, be open to new ideas, be willing to uh, challenge your own ideas as well. Um, and then I would say, let what's learned here uh, leaves here, but what's said here stays here. So if people are sharing, you know, th there's an opportunity, you know, with this kind of topic for people to share things that are pretty vulnerable or, um, you know, sensitive to about their unique experiences, I would say let's be really respectful of that and take the lessons away, but not necessarily take um, specific uh, people's individual experiences out of this room. And I think we can break the fourth wall and assume that you guys will respect that in the camera. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so I, I don't know, does anyone want to kind of get us started? Are there, did people come with questions or thoughts they were hoping that we would talk about today? Uh, so, Robin just said, do we do introductions? And I don't even think I introduced myself. So if you want, you, want, you started, if you want to take over. Yeah, um, my name's Aim. It's like a, like a bow. Um, I am, my pronouns are they, them, or he, him. Um, I'm mostly, like my biggest identifier is like, I just use trans as like an umbrella term. Um, but on top of that, there's the umbrella to make the term of queer. Um, like you said, queer, you know, a lot of people identify as just like queer. It's just so much easier than like going into specifics. Um, thank you. Oh, yeah, I work here and I'm a student. I, do, uh, I work for both of them. <laughs> librarian. Um, I would describe myself as an ally. Um, I feel like, as with most things, I'm here to learn and I'm here to help. So I'm glad we could have this conversation. And, you know, anything that I can do, I'm glad to be part of it. I'm Rebecca Soderbaum. I teach history here at Bristol. And um, I would also say that I am an ally um, and cheaper. Almost 25 years, so I'm not getting rid of them anytime soon. <laughs> so it's just nice to be here, and um, I'm really here in part to hear the student point of view. Um, I know that there's many points of view, but just to hear from students is what I like. And I teach history. Did I say that? Yes. Okay. Robin Worthington. I also teach history, being one of my wonderful yeah. students. Um, and um, I am straight, married a very long time to a man, uh, and, and I would say an ally as well, uh, because I teach United States history. Um, uh, I very personally and deeply understand the history of um, discrimination and prejudice, and prejudice against certain groups in the country that still goes on today, sadly. Um, so, yeah, and, and I'm here to bring the listener. Uh, can I join in? Of course, I'm on in. I'm Alice Wilson. My pronouns are teachers. Uh, I identify as a male teacher. <laughs> <laughs> I work with student family engagement as a student 
So I'm not really sure what I'm supposed to say, but I only work here at the library as an admin. Um, I don't buy cheaper, and I'm here to work. Hi, I'm Melissa Rogers, and I'm the for Joe's Education Coordinator. Um, she, her pronouns, and I strive to be an ally support to the community. Hey everyone, I'm Emma Bonsky. She, her pronouns, identify as part of the queer community. Um, also work in student and family engagement. Thanks to you all. Sure. Um, here as a member of the community, we're also a huge ally for our students that also identify as part of the queer spectrum. Yeah. My, name, uh, sorry, sorry. My name is Nicholas Patello. I go by he and pronouns. I am a member of Bristol Community College and I consider myself an ally. I'm on local Discord servers with members of the LGBTQ plus community. They're all very nice. I just want to be an ally for those who uh, are in the community and uh, want to be represented as their real selves. Cool. Uh, I think what I love what you said was about their real selves, their authentic selves. I think that's, to me, one of the most important things, especially being, uh, you know, a member of the staff at Bristol. Uh, and, and especially being with Bristol being a community college, we want Bristol to be a place where students can be their real selves, be their authentic selves. Um, at places I've worked at before, and I'm, I'm sure this is probably true for some of our Bristol students, uh, the person they are at college is not necessarily the same uh, persona they're able to, to have at home. So we know that uh, sometimes places like Bristol are can be a safe space for people to um, live their authentic identities where there might not be acceptance in other parts of their lives. So um, being a community college, we accept everyone who's, who's here to learn. Um, and that means we, we have people with all kinds of different identities um, that intersect in a lot of different ways. Um, so I think having events like this is really a good chance for folks to share their experience and also learn. Um, I would say the most important thing, especially when we talk about wanting to be allies, uh, but even if you are part of the community or a community that, that we're talking about, is holding on to that willingness to learn, to hear new information and bring it into what, what you already know and, and see how, how it might grow your knowledge and how it might maybe change how you, how you operate or maybe not, but at least be taken in. You're, you're someone who's willing to hear things without immediately dismissing. Yeah, so that's such a great, thank you for saying that. Anybody want to throw something out there? A question, a thought? Uh, how, do we, how do people think? What are people feeling? I know kind of what you said, what you said kind of true. We're like, at home, we don't feel as accepted. Like, I'm not at home, but I don't feel supported. But I feel so lucky. It's very like, important to have a space where I just like able to be able to contribute. Yeah, I'm glad that we're still gonna be that space and I hope that you know your home can maybe someday become that space as well. But I mean, in the meantime, I'm glad we're still here. Because everyone deserves that, right? Everyone deserves a place where they can feel safe, they can feel supported and you know, when we talk about the kind of legislation that we've seen being passed throughout the country, um, we know that's not true. There are, there are whole states, there are whole regions of the country where people can't live their, their authentic lives and, and live their true selves. And I, I'll say, just speak on person, you know, a um, personal level, um, my mom and stepdad moved down to Florida in 2015, and um, I think about it was maybe like a year and a half ago, um, a couple different LGBTQIA uh, organizations put out travel watches for Florida saying it is not safe for queer people here. 
Um, and I said to my mom, I said, listen, it's, it's complicated because I came out pretty late in life, like I was 31. Um, so my mom's like, still maybe not sure what this whole deal is because <laughs> she grew up, or I grew up 30 years straight and now I'm not, even though secretly you don't know it wasn't ever straight. <laughs> it took a really long time to figure that out. Um, but the point is, I told her, I said, I don't, even though I, I have a lot of privilege, I, I am married to a man, so I, I have passing privilege. I don't necessarily read as queer. I mean, depends on, uh, depends on where I am. Um, but I told her, I can't come to Florida anymore. I, 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 I feel safe at your house. I don't feel safe in your neighborhood. I don't, and I also don't want to put my travel dollars toward an economy that's doing this to people who I have similar identifiers as myself. I don't, that's not how I want to live my life. And she was like, yeah, of course, of course, of course. Um, but I think she doesn't, we haven't really talked about it. And I, I think she, thinks I may be taking a stand on something when really it's, no, this is something that's really important to me. And it's personal. And it's personal. It's personal, it's political, it's everything. And I would not, you know, I haven't broached this with her. I'd love it if she didn't live in Florida anymore. <laughs> like, I think that would be awesome. She came back here, but I don't, that doesn't seem like a, a conversation I can have with her. That is, I don't think we're at a point where that's going to come up. The first time I became aware, um, you know, really, like, you know, I think everybody grows up, and as you grow and you experience more of the world, you, you naturally become more aware of people different and all this stuff. But, like, you know, I got my first professional job out of graduate school and moved from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania to Oklahoma. And that's, you know, it was quite a culture change. And um, the, the friends that I made in higher ed who felt safe in higher ed who were members of the queer community who came from towns in rural Oklahoma who talked about the, and I want to use the term violence, but I don't always mean physical violence that they experienced growing up. They, they would talk about surviving these towns and surviving their families to make it to the cities where there were communities that they could become parts of. And like I, I remember being like coming from the north, you know, like in, in you don't think of these things as as starkly divided as they like. I guess maybe the naiveness that I grew up in, like I I, I, did, I was like it couldn't be that bad, but it is that bad, and it is that that's I mean people you know resort to suicide, they resort to you know because they're just the the lack of acceptance by their families, and it was such a rude awakening to go to a place like Oklahoma City and but it was also the experience was kind of you know as, as an outsider also wonderful to see the community that they built in Oklahoma City you know that there is the, the, the refuge you know so that, I don't know how to say it but it was just such an education to see to live in a state like that and to you know I don't know where I was going with it other than to say like it it is really scary in places like that. And I left in 2013. Mm -hmm. So like a lot of these laws have been passed since then. Right. And you know, but it was hostile before. You know, like I, I can't imagine. Yeah. I think um, it's weird too, because you think about these states that do have like actively negative laws against queer people. Um, but then you also, like, it's kind of weird because, like, I grew up in Connecticut and I was working for a bunch of because I, I've been identifying with friends since I was 12, 13. Um, and, like, I, I was, like, asked, like, the most basic questions and people, like, didn't need to know. Um, and my school didn't do anything about it. So it was really, it's really weird because even in like, places where it's supposed to be safe, it's not. And then you go to places that are not, like you know where it's safe, and it's worse. And with legislation, it's getting worse. It yeah, looks like it's getting worse everywhere. There's a climate of 
less accountability for the kind of violence that, that the, the physical, the overt, and the more insidious kind of violence that we see. It's really like, I feel like my existence and the existence of my community is kind of a term of what you meant. So it's like, what? I'm sorry, you didn't hear that. I've been, I feel like my existence and the existence of my community has been turned into like a book of man. Absolutely. Yeah, it's been used for political purposes, right? Yeah. As opposed you to know, just like, trying to see people as individuals. Yeah, I feel like there's this thing where it's like all the tissues, you know, they can use that with me and I'm just trying to get my life mm -hmm. like happily. It's, it's really very interesting because gender, the way I see it, gender is like the last sort of the line in the sand, right? So um, people who would say like, you know, well, you know, um, you know, I, I, you know, I don't treat people with different races or blah blah. I want to acknowledge right here. Race and gender are social constructs. So, but but yeah, we use them, so we have to acknowledge them. That's my opinion. That would say like, well, I you know I don't treat people of other races any differently. And where but where they draw the line is gender. It's really very fascinating. I see gender as sort of the last sort of line that has to be crossed, if you know what I mean. And maybe part of it is because people um, confuse um, sex with gender, right? So there's this biological aspect to it, right? Well, what do you mean? You know, obviously you're a fill in the blank, right? And it's just very binary, right? That we look at gender in a very binary way. Um, and it's, it's troubling, obviously. But, but as a scholar also, or I can sit back and say that it's just fascinating to think about why that is sort of the last frontier. You know, that, and and uh, I don't know, do you remember Rebecca, Rebecca when we were, Rebecca and I co-teach a co-taught course in the fall on democracy. And one of the things, oh, are you one, talking about the, the very, was it Norway? So we were, so one of the things where the students picked different countries to talk about if they were strong democracies or on the weaker side or in the you know, like what kind of democracy and why. Mm -hmm. Norway was number one or number two? Number one. Number it's one. The strongest democracy in the world right now. And he said, and so our student was giving the talk about like Norway, and we're all like, oh, Norway, you know, we're all dreaming of living in Norway at this moment. And then, I didn't mean to hijack. No, Do you wanna? Yeah. So, so <laughs> what happens is one of the students, he's like, but there is one thing. A lot of, a lot of girls get raped in Norway. And the, per the percentage was super high at a super young age. And we were all, the whole class was <laughs> like, that's, the way he, he didn't mean it as like, Oh, there's one small thing that isn't important. <laughs> but it sort of hit us all right in the stomach because we were just like, wait, what? No, none of us knew this. And here, it's really cold in Norway for a lot of months. People are inside, so there's domestic abuse. There's, there's, um, there's no law against... What did, they say? what did he say? There's no law against, um, against rape basically. And so why they don't just make a law against rape, I'm not sure what's going on there, but that like was a perfect rape. example. So, so the, the theory, his, it, the, he had data to support this, was that, um, you know, kids like 13-year-olds like are going to their friends' houses to have sleepovers, maybe the older brother rapes, I don't know, but things like from 13 on, there was trauma. And it was a very huge high percentage. The research was there, and we were all sh just flat. And, and I'm not sure it was because there's no laws against 
great. I think it was that the it was the standard of proof maybe to prove right. I you think he said? I think he said maybe not put children aside, but I think he said there was no law. But what, what actually I was thinking about something else, right? I guess so we should I, find this out I before we're giving you all yes, this information. Yes, information. But like well, basically well, they're, they're having a huge problem. Like, problem. Mm -hmm. she, thank you. <laughs> they're having a huge problem with rape and um, child abuse. And, and it's like this hidden. Yes. Right. Yes. Right. yes. yes. Right. So this here sort of is this like major issue. Uh, democracy that you know this it's so held up it's held up as being like the strongest democracy. And of course part of democracy is respect for human rights. And yet even in this sort of place where we think it's so wonderful, wonderful perfect place to live. There's still this gender stuff going on. Really really amazing. I feel like you can kind of see a parallel from that to Kind of what Ian was talking about, where like even in Massachusetts, right, where in a place that is open, but the map kind of reminded me. In the case of transgendered bathrooms, we do have you no know, ban on transgendered bathrooms. But if we're not making them accessible in public spaces, are we really supporting what we believe in? Um, it's kind of like a cop out almost. Like yes, we. We're so supportive of you, but we're not going to give any resources to help you out in that. And so it's kind of like Norway, where it's like, we're so democratic about what's not going to help you when you're in trouble, you know, or when you need support. But we care about you, but do we care about you kind of a thing? I think that's something, too. Even at this college, I see a lot of, like, like I try to find a gender neutral bathroom every time I can because I just don't feel comfortable going sure. to a gender mm -hmm. bathroom. H building doesn't have a gender, a gender neutral bathroom. I didn't think Mini Bedford campus had one. I went Monday, they have one in the basement. Um, and that's technically a like, oh, UMass campus. Hallway. Yeah, that was pretty hallway. And right hallway. across from this like medical yep. lab when like, it like, where it is this hairy mm -hmm. like medical building. Ours is in that hallway, it's not scary. I like that. Mm -hmm. Those ones you have to mm -hmm. medical building. The medical building. Yeah. It, it watches you. You go into, you go yeah. across and you close the door, and you're like, is that thing going to come along? Right. Uh, not, not to hype chat, but like the amount of disinformation about the bathrooms is like just crazy. Like, and my my mom's best friend, who we all refer to as Crazy Carol, that gives you any like, and I love her. She's so sweet. She's so mad at you. Crazy yeah, Carol, crazy, right? you're crazy. <laughs> um, she was, she, <laughs> she was worried about litter boxes. Oh. And we're talking, and I was like, I was like, yeah, there was a like we're talking story about that and mm -hmm. and we're talking rumor that got started that some K-12 institutions were <sighs> allowing students to identify as cats and that there were litter boxes placed into bathrooms uh, so that to, to support uh, these, the, the children's uh, cat identity. It is not based in fact. Um, it has nothing to do, and it's to, to your point about boogeyman and boogeyman, it's a way of that uh, some news outlets, uh, a lot of them with a certain particular leaning, use to make these inflammatory statements and, and really demonize and dehumanize, and dehumanize to kind of co-opt language that we use around gender identity and, and accommodating people of all types of genders and sexualities and abilities uh, to, as this horrible thing, we believe it, and, and that it fires people up and then just promotes this sort of anti-LGBT mentality. And then by the time Carol had ingested this story mm -hmm. and repeated it at my mother's dinner table. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that she said was it was at her grandkids' school. Of course. And it was that's how her mother oh, Yes. Her. And so it, it's like it's it's you use this term and I love this term insidious. You know, and it, it, it is absolutely insidious. Mm -hmm. Me too. It's uh, yeah. um, I think it's important also mention like how much work discrimination is um, for people 
So it's just like there's that awareness as well. Yeah, well, thank like, you for pointing that out. Yeah, yeah. like it's awesome when it happens the other way. Like actually, no, we should be accepting of people for people, but it can have unfortunately the negative. Yeah, some people are really interested in being allies when it's abstract <laughs> and they're not confronted with having to really untangle what that means in their real life. Yeah, I think that um, I've seen that happen a lot with like my trans friends because like I grew uh, when I was in high school, I went to like an artsy high school. Most of the people in my high school were queer, um, and like all of my friends were trans people, specifically like trans men and non-binary. Um, but I saw it happen with each one of their parents. It'd be like, we'd come over, the parents were fine with us. They'd call us by the correct pronouns, the correct, correct names. But then they'd look at their own child and they'd be like, misgendered them, calling them by their dead name. Because I think they just don't, they either don't get it or they can't handle it. This is the, I want to make a comment about what you said about high school because this is something that, you know, I, like, I feel like I've entered old, like the old portion of my life. Like I've lived, I've lived long enough to be like youngins, aww. Um, <laughs> youngins. But so you said, you, 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 you made a comment. <laughs> so I spent 10 years in Oklahoma. I like it. Um, y'all. Y'all. Uh, you know, you went to high school with most, mostly queer people. Right? I went to a smart None of my high school friends were gay. Not a single one. To BS, but they right? were. Complete right, BS, right. right? So I went to high school in the 90s. I wasn't gay. Yeah, me. exactly. And I think about that now. And I think about, so like, I graduated high school in 1998. Nobody was gay. Nope. Not a single person. I couldn't tell you up and down anybody who would come out of, you know, at all. The first person I knew personally was my cousin Jason, who you know, had come out, um, but he was already out of college. Like it was, it, it, it was, it was very not anything that I knew. My experience was very boxed, right? Like very closed in. And um, you know, one of the things that I, I can track, and I, I want to ask this this question about representation to people in the community. Like, has representation? Do you feel that it's adequate? Like in media, in television, in movies, because like from where I sit, like completely on the sidelines, like I can remember there being no representation to like, and I'm talking like representation of um, multiracial couples to queer couples to, you know, like multiple different types of things. Do you feel that that's harmful, helpful? Do you like? Do you think it helps move the conversation? I, I just wonder. Or does it cause backlash? I think but there's both, both. no such thing as good representation mm -hmm. because there are so many people in these communities mm -hmm. that see that and they'll either say, oh, that, that looks like me, or they'll say, that doesn't look like me at all. At all. Because, yeah. like you said earlier, we're not a No. So I think either all representation is good or all representation is bad because there is no, you know, I think what we really need is more mm -hmm. because that way everyone can see themselves, whether it's, you know, because if this person, if this representation is like, oh, that's, that's like, that doesn't align with me, people aren't going to like see themselves in that. But if there's more representation in general, someone's going to find something. Mm -hmm. I would agree that more is better. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, we're certainly not at the point where media is representative of the percentages of the community. Mm -hmm. Like, if you've got 50% gay people in the community, it's not representative. No. I also feel like, yes, it's improving. Like, you can turn the TV on and maybe you'll see a queer couple mm -hmm. every 20th show, but it's also, a lot of it is like, projected stereotypes so yep. like here's another gay movie with a flamboyant male and it's like again it's reinforcing a stereotype that's not accurate on the community. I mean I would honestly personally agree with the uh, <coughs> stereotypes in the LGBTQ plus community. Of course there's also the issue of queer baiting where sometimes mm -hmm. sometimes yeah. like uh, certain movies like <coughs> there's a gay <coughs> Or this would be like a trans individual, but they only get like two seconds of screen time. I think 
So something that infuriated me so much, I'm technically also gender fluid, like I just I just use queer or trans because it's so much, you know. So that's the label I've been using since I was 13. Um, the Loki show came out recently, and in the, in the comic books and like kind of agreed upon by like Pagans, um, Loki the god and the comic book character is gender fluid. And that's like a very well-known fact. But we were kind of told when the show came out that Loki was going to be like confirmed gender fluid. There was like some hinting at it. And he wasn't. He was confirmed bisexual, which was like, OK, cool, win. But <laughs> the only thing, because Loki is a shapeshifter, so like, you know, the only thing we really got which wasn't even representative, was in the title screen beginning, there's a part that goes, there's like a paper and it shows his file, and there's a part that says sex fluid, which is not the same thing as gender fluid. Sex and gender, are, they're just different. Yeah. Um, also, it's like more, I don't know, probably's not gonna do anything for me. What are they gonna do for me? They're gonna take my money. Um, but they treat women great too. Do so. they? Yeah. Do they? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so it really it was infuriating because I've kind of been like, I don't know if they actually promised anything, but there have been talks yeah. about it. There was like mm -hmm. kind of like you were anticipating. Yeah. Something. Yeah. Something. Yeah. And I think, and I am bisexual, mm -hmm. but like. The more I so many people are bisexual right now, it's so easy right now. Like, it's not a trend, you know, obviously, but like, so many people are bisexual that I know, and so many people, like, they're TV characters, and I don't know any that are confirmed bisexual, right. but I have so many TV characters that were like, my bisexual icons, yeah. 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 So, it was for that, but I was also kind of like, right. okay, you can do that, I get that, but can you do this? Because that's a whole other player. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and so, I have a couple different exciting things that I want to talk about, but uh, that kind of bring in what Emily was saying, and what you were saying, and actually what you were saying about queer baiting. I think, actually, what everyone's been saying, mm -hmm. there's, there's, you know, more is better, for sure, because there's no one way to be gay or queer or gender fluid or trans, um, you know, and I think it, the representation, there's absolutely more than there was in 1995 when I was coming of age, but uh, there could still be more. And it's also always the question for me is, was this written, was this gay character written by someone who's gay? Was this trans character, is this trans character being portrayed by someone who's trans? You know, are we getting actual representation or are we getting what the studio has, you know, deemed acceptable to put out there? Um, so there's that layer. And then I love to talk about bisexuality because bisexuality didn't get invented until the 2000s. <laughs> it's a joke, that is a joke. There is a very, um, deeply troubling article. I think it was in Newsweek, it might have been in Time, circa 1993 or maybe 1995, which talks about the new bisexuality. And if you read it, it completely conflates being bisexual with being polyamorous. Those are two different things. Bisexuality is traditionally defined as someone who uh, is sexually attracted to people of their gender as well as people of other genders. That's how I define it for myself and I, how I use the label. Um, polyamory is someone who has multiple romantic and or sexual relationships. Um, and, it, and it's a whole world of, of different ways that it can play out in, in real life. And people who are polyamorous could be bisexual and vice versa, but if they're not, it's not a one to one kind of thing. And so this article, you know, coming out in a major national news publication in the mid-90s that completely gets wrong what actual lived bisexuality is and ignores what polyamory is was such a disservice. And, like like you, I grew up and was consuming media in the 90s where 
there wasn't that much representation of the community. Most of what the representation was was about tragedy, yeah. you know. Um, the year I was, uh, when I was in high school, um, gosh, I can't remember the actress's name, Hillary whatever, won an Emmy. Swank. Hillary Swank, right? Don't cry. Won an Emmy for Boys yeah. Don't Cry, where she is a straight cisgender woman playing a trans man um, and earning accolades for this extremely violent <laughs> now, of, a, of a, a terribly horrific situation that, that happened to a real person. Um, but that's that's how, for I think a lot of the community, that's how that's where representation starts. It's, a, it's not about celebration. It's not even about like queer people are just living their lives or just trying to live their lives. It's like, oh, look at this horrible thing. It's sort of gratuitous, you know, violence oh, on the screen. Yeah. Matt. Matt. I'm trying to remember the young man that was tied Shepherd. to Oh, Matthew yes. Shepard? Yes. Yep. And that's where we are. Yeah, yeah. 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 And so I think what most queer people, and I don't speak for everybody, but most of what we're looking for is just like we're people, yeah. right? Yeah. And we just yeah. want to live yeah. lives yeah. that aren't hurting anybody, and just don't want to don't want to be. We don't want to be the symbols of queerness. We don't yeah. want to be the stereotypes. We just want to move through and like not have to deal with people giving us a hard time. I think oh, every time I talk about queer representation. I always have to bring up Star Trek Deep Space Nine because there's this episode where there's this character, Gypsy Adapt, and she's like this alien that's like a symbiote, like she's she's got a like a like like a worm kind of thing that carries all her past hosts' memories. So the symbiote is like inside of her stomach, and so there's this episode. Um, where like this scientist, she's like a science officer, and this scientist comes to the station, and the scientist was one of her hosts' past lovers, so or like past wives. Um, so in this like society, if your like host dies, the worm has to move to it. Symbian has to move to another post because it's like this is a lot of backstory. <laughs> <laughs> it's like forbidden for her and this woman to be together because they're like their past posts were married. Oh, but then they like she comes to the station and it's like the best episode ever. They put the music in, in like the best places to create the most tension. And then like basically they fall in love again. And it's like forbidden because of like they were married in the past. Um, so it's like a really good queer episode. Yeah, she is like a woman. And then this host is a woman. And there's also this dynamic of like, this taboo for women. Um, planet in their society that they should be together. It's just like, it's such a good episode, but it's so heart wrenching, and they like, it's like, but it's really crazy growing up in like the 2000s, having nothing. All I have is like, like I've come home from school and watched the Ellen show, and that was my representation. Um, seeing this, which was like filmed in the late 80s, early 90s. And like having this like lesbian kiss on screen, and it wasn't just like a lesbian kiss; it was like passionate, like you couldn't keep it. Like really a great episode, but um, it was so surprising to me to see that because I was like, I'm so used to the queer babies where it's like, oh, they're not gonna kiss, and then they kissed, and I was like. The first time I watched it, I was eating, I was eating at my desk, and I slammed my hand so hard on the desk that it started bleeding. I was so happy because <laughs> I was like, "This is the nice and this like they made this episode." Yeah, yeah, it's like 
this is important. Yeah. No, I think, I think, and that kind of, to me, also speaks to how things, this, that's a pretty clear example of, uh, you kind of feel like people who were filming that knew that it was going to be queer representation, but that lots of things can feel like queer representation, even when it's not necessarily set out to be. Mm -hmm. Like, and, and that's maybe part of being part of an oppressed population is like, you look for it, mm -hmm. even where it's not, and you're like, oh, this is my, I, I know they haven't said this character is bisexual, but in my mind, this character is bisexual. Mm -hmm. this is the I grew up on, like, my favorite show in middle school was Supernatural, mm -hmm. and the whole, like, thing about that, the whole joke is that it ended, and then killed off the character, like, as soon as it ended, like, the last season. It ran for 15 seasons. It should have been done at season five. Like, <laughs> it, it was horrible at that. But, um, the whole joke in, like, the fandom is, like, the character who everyone's is, like, he's probably gay, comes out and is, like, I love you to, like, the person they all, like, the fandom wants him to be with. And then he dies, like, immediately after. <laughs> and that's, like, the entire fandom is, like, why'd you do that? Just let him live. Right. Um, right. So that's what I was, like, used to, is, yeah. like, looking for representation where, like, they're not going to do it. Yeah. 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 Uh, that's your point. I mean, it's basically much of the same thing as a uh, head camp. I'm in, I, I'm in the Dagan Rampa community, and the community loves to do like a certain head character, head candidates and characters. Like, like some people would say, like, like oh, just as a hypothetical, like uh, Makoto Naegi, the main character first of the first game, say like he's bisexual, or maybe he's like, uh, maybe he's asexual, stuff like that. Of course, uh, there's uh, some people who say that Jigoro Fujisaki is trans. And, of course, that's kind of like a like a whole bag of worms I don't really want to get into. But it's like I get why you want to have head cannons. Like you want to be represented by someone. Yeah. But sometimes uh, I have to agree with your point. It's just you have to have representation. It's actually real representation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's sort of our own version that we kind of comfort ourselves with, but we also want to see it official. You know, kind of like what you were saying, Abe, about having that character teased as being gender queer or gender fluid. I'm sorry, and then doesn't, nothing there's not nothing happen. in evidence. Like, yeah, we can kind of in our personal experience say, oh yeah, well in my mind he is, or they are, or whatever. Uh, but it's also, you know, we need that. We need it to be stated explicitly too. I mean, I think the reason that that character is gender fluid, like in the actual show would be so important to me because I was bullied for that. Mm -hmm. And so like having such a major production yeah. that like you know, we'll be probably gonna watch right. and be like, hey this thing exists um would have like been the position. Yeah. Absolutely. They can help us feel. So I guess, you know, one of the things that I'd like to know is in my everyday life, how can I create an environment? Um, you know, if, if we're talking openly here, one of the things that, you know, I hate to admit it, but I struggle with pronouns. And I struggle with them because they do, they're not, it's something new and it's different and I want to say them right but I'm afraid of messing up and I'm afraid of saying it wrong. And how do I, you know, if I do screw up, what do I do? What do I say? How do I do that with grace and not be um, insulting? Like, how, how do we give, like, I don't, I don't know, does that make sense? Yeah. Like, because it's like I clearly want to not insult anybody. Um, but th that wasn't part of my, you know, we went around and did introductions and I completely forgot to give my pronouns, even though both of you did. And it, it's like, I think that, I guess I would just like, you know, how do we, how do we, how do we become 
more welcoming, more inclusive in general, I think. Like, does that make sense? I was going to say, I have thoughts, but I want to give it to the folks who have so, lived experience. Tell, do you want to tell them what happened the other day with me in class? You misgendered me. I, I did. Fine. I don't care. Um, I did, and she came, she, they, but he, sorry, came up to me, your, your, he, they, your, they, your, they, they, your, he, okay. yeah. uh, came up to me after class and said, you know, I'm, and I, and I was like, oh, my mind, you grow now. Yeah, and I think the but, thing is, like, I used to get it wrong to <laughs> all my friends. Um, it's really just practice. Mm -hmm. So, if you get it wrong, like, I used to just be like, apologize and move on, like, apologize, correct it, move on. I don't even want an apology anymore. Because, like, I'm, there's this thing that people will do is that they'll apologize too much mm -hmm. and then put it back on me. And it's like, I don't want it to be back on me. It's not a big deal. So, if you just, like, if you're like, oh, sorry, or you don't feel like it's a problem, I'm like, sorry, correct it, move on. Don't beat yourself up about it. Okay. And I was really glad that you brought it up to me because I get just it happens. Because mm -hmm. I think it's just like the more the more trans people I was around, the more like, the better I got at it. And then that more natural it feels. Yeah, it just feels and like I think worrying about it. I was gonna say, I think the more we put energy into worrying about messing up, the more likely it is that we mess up. <laughs> and the more the sure. it feels like. Yep. Whereas, if you can get to a place where you're practicing, I, I um, make a point of talking about my, you know, about people and and saying their pronoun, making sure I'm saying their pronoun. Um, this is a, maybe a really weird thing, but my spouse uh, are giant stuffed animal for Christmas one year and I was like this person this penguin is non-binary and her, like, my husband was like what and I was like no seriously I'm going to use they them pronouns because I want to make sure I'm normalizing using they them pronouns and, and, and I, I, that is not a reflection on the people in my life who use they them pronouns they are not penguins I don't need to diminish them to this uh, stuffed animal but it was a chance for me to kind of use an entity and, and practice, like you said. And again, like taking, like letting yourself take the stigma away makes it easier to just get used to it and use it correctly and not be the, like it's so easy to go into the shame spiral. Of, oh my God, I'm so sorry. I know, I, I, I promise I'm an ally. I know, I, I know better. And it's like, we don't care. We don't care. Uh, just. Yeah, just do it. I think I can just do it different words. words a thousand times, but like if I mess up a pronoun, I know I'm going to feel bad. The thing is, no we know whether it's purposeful mm -hmm. or whether it's yeah. right. Like, yeah. we just we do. So I have like two points. One, if you're wondering how to do it properly, think about it if it was you, how would you want somebody to do it? Mm -hmm. So let's say somebody walks up to you and let's say you're Christian and they call you a Jew, or vice versa, or whatever. How would you react to that? It depends on if it was intentional right. or if it was just a mistake. And everybody's different. Mm -hmm. So treat everybody individually because there are some trans people who if you misjudge them, they will freak out. Right. That is just how they are. It's a big deal for them. They need it to be right. But there are some who don't care. But everybody's different. Mm -hmm. right. So you just do your best. And how would you feel if it was you? Well, I think the majority, it's Anytime I've ever seen a trans person flip out is because someone's been doing it intentionally. Or right. they've been reminded oh, yeah. so many times yeah. and they haven't. They're still coming under it and they're still doing it. So it, it either is intentional or it feels intentional. Right. So I think um, it's more about like, because it's not like, like we're, we're reasonable people. <laughs> we're not like going to freak out at you because you do it like, yeah, a few times. But if you're like, you know, if, if it's not intentional, then we're not going to be upset. I was going to say, like, you can use, like, if you don't have a penguin, like, <laughs> you can use inclusive, pen, uh, in, <laughs> inclusive <laughs> pronouns, like, yep. they that of folks that don't identify as friends. Mm -hmm. Like, you could say, hey, I was just at this panel with an Emma, even though I go by she, her, you could say, they thought it was great. Mm -hmm. Like, you could start using they 
it's so hard because it's grammatically incorrect. So if you're a grammar maven, it's really hard. It's really well, hard. It's, it's been using it's may as a, as a singular since like the 13th century. I was going to say, yeah. I feel like they then was, was somewhat common though, to refer to somebody in the abstract like they will be presenting I as, I you know, such and such. They don't have to say she or he when you're here. Yeah. Just on the flip side yeah, to like that, I would say is that if there's someone who's trans and uses he or uses right. she, it could actually be a microaggression to use they. Yeah. Yeah. That could signal oh, wow. like, oh, oh th there's something weird. I don't know what. Yeah. And instead of just being like, yes, yeah, she. Oh, I, so so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> show my age and it's sideshow Bob walking through the basement and hitting something with break. 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 Yes. Yes. I know. Um, <laughs> Thank you.